Okay, in this video, I wanted to talk about the Heisenberg picture in quantum field theory. So up to this point, we've been working with, working in the Schrodinger picture, meaning the time dependence has been in the states rather than the operators. So our fields, which are now operators, have only depended on uh, the space coordinates and not time. So now we're going to switch over to the Heisenberg picture. So first we should review the difference between the Schrodinger picture and Heisenberg picture in ordinary quantum mechanics. So in the Schrodinger picture, obviously you have the states obey the Schrodinger equation and the time dependence. You can find the uh, time evolution of a state by acting with this time evolution operator. In the Heisenberg picture, uh, so the, the Heisenberg operators are related to the Schrodinger operators like this, and the Heisenberg operators obey the Heisenberg equation of motion. So, and um, in either of those pictures, when you take the expectation value in some state, you get the same answer. So if I have in the Schrodinger picture, I would take, you know, to find the expectation value of this operator in the state as a function of time, I would squish it between the time dependent states. And in the Heisenberg picture, I would um, take my Heisenberg operator and squish it between my uh, time independent states. But both of these expressions are going to be equivalent to this. So you can see here either the only difference here is I, either I associate these exponentials with the states in the Heisenberg or in the Schrodinger picture or I associate them with the operator in the Heisenberg picture. Uh, but either way it leads to the same expressions, the same physical results. Uh, so our goal here is to change, is to go from our Schrodinger operators, which are our fields that depend only on the spatial coordinates, uh, and transform those to Heisenberg operators uh, that depend on time as well. And we're going to just use, you know, for, for our three vectors, we've been using these arrows. For four vectors, we're just going to leave them off. So when I say 5x, I mean x, y, z, and t, not just x. Uh, so first, the first thing uh, that you can do before we find what that is, is we can compute the Heisenberg equation of motion for our fields. So our fields, even the Heisenberg fields will still satisfy the same commutation relations. So we can compute these things. Um, so in the case of the Klein-Gordon field, the time evolution of phi will be given by the commutator of Klein-Gordon Hamiltonian and phi. And uh, so I've written that out here. And uh, basically you just get pi, which is uh, something we already knew. It's not too exciting. And so we have we know everything we need to calculate this commutator, so I'm not going to go through it. The only thing to note is this middle term, we have this, so, okay, so the first term, you know, it's a pi squared and a phi, and you can compute that very easily because we know the commutation relation for phi and pi, and you can use, you know, just like in ordinary quantum mechanics, the commutator of x and p is like i h bar, and the commutator of x and a function of p goes as uh, like the derivative of that function with respect to p times the commutator. So similarly here, basically, this term will go as the derivative of pi squared with respect to pi, which is pi. And then you get the commutator of phi and pi, which will give you a delta function, so you can do this integral, so it, it works out. So if you've, basically, if you've been going through and actually doing the math, everything so far, then it shouldn't be too difficult to work this out. The only subtle thing um, is with this middle term. So, uh, so the, okay. So first, the last term 
for the commutator phi and phi is zero, so that goes away. But this middle term, we have this gradient, and the only thing to note is that uh, this, this gradient operator only acts on the y-coordinates. So when I take the commutator, it's, it'll basically be the commu like the gradient of the commutator of phi and phi, which is still zero. So these two terms will be zero, and this one just contributes a pi, basically. And so similarly, you can uh, compute the time evolution of pi. And uh, that's a little bit more complicated. But again, uh, we have everything we need to compute it. And I think in David Tong's lecture notes, he does go into enough detail to work it out if you want to. Uh, but the point of all this is that if we combine these two equations of motion, we get the Klein-Gordon equation. And that's interesting because, so, I mean, on, on, in one sense, it's not that interesting because obviously if we're working with the Klein-Gordon field, then we would expect to get the Klein-Gordon equation somewhere. But what is new and interesting is this Klein-Gordon uh, Klein equation, uh, these, these are, are quantum fields. So before we had the Klein-Gordon equation for classical fields, uh, but here, so we derived these, this equation from the Heisenberg equations of motion. We derived it from, you know, commutation relations, basically. So this is our quantum field, our quantum scalar field um, will satisfy the Klein-Gordon equation, which is, which is cool. And uh, so the last thing to do is to actually calculate what our... Um, our Heisenberg field, our Heisenberg operator, looks like. So just like in ordinary quantum mechanics, we just take our Schrodinger operator, or Schrodinger field in this case, and just sandwich it between these two uh, operators. And if we write that out, so I've just written out you know, our usual expansion for phi of x, and then we can move these operators inwards for both of these terms. And if you do that as much as you can, then you end up with um, our raising and lowering operators being sandwiched. And so you can compute these things. Uh, th this type of expression comes up frequently in ordinary quantum mechanics. And you can use what's known as the baker hausdorff formula, which is uh, you, so you can write this as kind of an infinite sum involving these kind of nested commutators between, uh, in this case, H and A, which at first glance seems hopeless, but if you write out the first few terms, so we, we've already worked out what the commutator of H and AP is. It's minus EP AP. And so once you have that, it's easy to work. So this will end up being the commutator of H and EPAP, which I can pull the EP out, so I'll just get another EPAP. So that'll end up with an EP squared AP. You can work it out in more detail if you want, but yeah. So I end up with this, and then in this expression, I can factor out an AP, and I'm left with this, which you can read off as this exponential thing. So um, hopefully you've uh, you know, at least I have, in ordinary quantum mechanics, worked through things like this, and usually it works out this way. You have this infinite sum, but you can kind of read off what it is in terms of, you know, a Taylor expansion of some function. So, in this case, that function is e to the minus iept. And, uh, so, and similarly, when we squish the raising operator, we get this expression, so just the same kind of thing, but with a plus sign. And so we can replace um, these expressions with these. And if we do that, we get something that looks very similar to what we had before. It's only, well, hopefully you could see what I was doing there. Uh, but so you, you get something that's very similar to what we had before. Basically, you know, the only difference it looks like is 
uh, the minus sign has switched. Also, I forgot to put dagger here. Okay. So in this expression, basically, uh, here we have a plus sign in this exponential. Here we have a minus sign. And in this one, it's flipped. So the minus sign is here and the plus is here. The only reason for that is this p dot x is going to be you know, our, our four vector dot product. So by definition, it has this minus the time part and plus the spatial, or sorry, no, sorry. It should be the opposite of that. This should be plus, then this should be minus, minus. Okay. And so that's why we have this minus sign here. So there's still a, a plus sign in this one associated with the spatial, you know, p dot x. It's just that, uh, yeah. So it's a kind of a subtle difference here, but this is our Heisenberg operators. This is what we're going to be using from now on. Uh, the motivation for it, I guess, is this is a more manifestly Lorentz invariant form for our operator, you know, it involving a uh, four vector dot product. So it will, I guess, help us out later 